that many scientists have warned about the homogeneity and the vulnerability of the system, this system still exists. Now there's more than 200 million hectares of transgenic crops, of which 65% of them are soybean Roundup ready, that is resistant to, to Roundup, which is a major herbicide that uh, uh, has many environmental impacts, health impacts, but condemns farmers to monocultures. Because when you grow here, for example, soybean, which is genetically engineered, over, for example, a stubble of corn or wheat, uh, you cannot grow anything else because everything else dies. You cannot diversify the system. You cannot break out of monocultures when you use these herbicides. The other thing that is happening is that this agriculture is kind of suicidal because it produces the greenhouse gases, but it's very susceptible to climate change. Actually, in the year 2012, there was drought in the Midwest, affected 30% of production of corn and soybean, which is mostly transgenic. And this is the curve that always uh, the people from Davis and other universities, land grant universities, pride themselves on how productive has been our agriculture in the United States. Well, you can see that definitely there has been an increase in productivity because of the fossil fuel based inputs that go into it. But look at this point here, 2012, the drought. So that shows you how vulnerable the system is. You know, everything is, is very good until climate change hits and then the system collapses. So here in California in 2014, we actually lost about $1.5 billion uh, in losses and many, many farm workers, which de we depend on, they come on from Mexico, as you know. Uh, had to leave because they have no jobs. And then recently, the hurricane in, in, in Puerto Rico, I was there in June, very, very much devastated the monocultures uh, for export production of, of sugarcane, uh, of bananas, and, and pineapples. So let me give you some examples of why these systems are the systems that hold the key for the future. For example, these are uh, rice paddies that you find in Southeast Asia, in China, in Japan, in many parts where uh, farmers have rice, but they also have many other components, you know, many fruit trees and rotations in, in the time when it's not a rainy season. And inside the system, you, you'll find fish, which is a very important source of protein, but these fish play a very important function in regulating weeds, for example. They eat the weeds, they also push the, the, the rice, and those insects that are there are leaf hoppers that transmit viruses. They fall down, they eat them, so they play an ecological function they, of, uh, in biological control. Then you can see that there's a green carpet under the rice, which is azola. Azola, actually, it's a symbiosis between a fern and an algae that fixes 240 kilos of nitrogen, of which 40% go to the, to the rice. So therefore, you don't need to apply any fertilizers. But what happens also is that uh, if you leave that carpet there too long, it's going to suffocate the oxygen of the water and, and kill the fish. So they bring ducks. The ducks eat the, 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 the azola, they also poo-poo, and they also eat, eat, eat insects and snails and so on. And at the end, you end up with a system where the farmer is an ecological engineer. All they, they do is put together, you know, the, the biodiversity that has to be present in the system, and through their interactions, they start promoting the sponsoring of the function of the system, the recycling of nutrients, the biological control of pests and so on. That's what agroecology is. Campesino Campesino is a farmer-to-farmer -farmer network and an horizontal pedagogical system of training in which actually extensions and experts like myself don't play any role. The farmers are the ones that transmit the, the knowledge from one, from one to the other. And this is what happened in Cuba. In 1999, after the collapse of the Soviet bloc, there were 216 farmers practicing agroecology Today there's more than 120,000 because of the multiplying effect of the campesino campesino methodology. So it consists of bringing an expert, a woman or a man, farmer from a nearby community that trains them in a particular technique, especially soil conservation. And then these farmers, each one of them becomes a multiplier and then trains another 10 or 20 farmers. And that's the way this information spreads. So agroecology that started with NGOs, then jumped into academia, now it's in the hands of social movements. So they have a much more militant agroecology. It's not this light version of agroecology that we have in Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> so it has been taken by social movement and is seen as a transformative science to commit it to a major just and sustainable future by reshaping power relations from farm, from, from, from farm to table. And why is agroecology compatible with social movements? Because it's socially activating, requires participation of people and commitment. It's economically viable because it doesn't depend on external inputs. 
is culturally appropriate because it respects and mobilizes the tradition of knowledge. It doesn't impose, you know, the Western model of science on the people's science. And it's ecologically sound because it optimizes, revitalizes present systems. We need changes in policies. We need to support farmers to networks, fund more research and education on agriculture, providing enabling public policies, empowering women, making a strategic alliance between scientists and NGOs and social movements. But also, we need to understand what drives agroecological massification. And one of the things that drives it is obviously social organization, which is the milieu where agroecology spreads. You know, without social organization, you're not going to have the spread of these alternatives. You have to have networks, agroecological practices, leaders with a mobilizing discourse, and all of these components are important. But the most important thing is not so much to depend on policies, but rather on, on the grassroots initiatives. And we need to take action because if we don't, as people, then uh, corporations are going to determine our future, which is not going to be that far from here, maybe 20, 30 years for a livable planet. Thank you.